like we just found out we both lived in Venezuela when she was a child and me when I was a teenager. So that was pretty interesting. I, I wish we could talk longer about that. Uh, Jackie has been a ha uh, long life, uh, has had a lo lifelong love for nature. Growing up in Venezuela, it was orchids. After completing her fine arts and education degree at Middlebury College, she changed her focus to plants and began taking classes at the University of Vermont. She spent three years as a ranger naturalist on top of Vermont's highest mountains, protecting the rare Arctic alpine tundra, and illustrated a guide to the mountaintop community. After a decade on the high seas, she settled on for London, where she completed a landscape design degree at Broward Community College. She has been gardening for birds and butterflies since the 1980s. She now lives in Fort White, Florida, which I never even heard of before <laughs> today. Fort White. Fort White. It's what, up north towards Gainesville? And her one acre jar is 99% uh, Florida native plants. You will find her home on the map for the Homegrown National Park which is at uh, homegrownnationalpark.org. Jackie has been working during the last 17 years with Audubon Florida as the go-to person for Florida's 45 chapters. In her role, she promotes the National Audubon Plans for Birds program. For the past three years, she also has served as the liaison to the Florida Power and Light Solar Stewardship Program and the Audubon Florida FPL Plans for Birds grant program. Thank you for joining us. All right, very, very briefly, I would like to present this award on Orange Audubon this past year, one chapter of the year. So you guys are in really good company. So give, give the, uh, the board a hand. We'll take a picture later. We, we have a, a cake. For it when we first. Oh, good, 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 good. <laughs> all right, so we gotta add a little energy to this room. We've got a big room and people are all spread out. <laughs> if I had plants to give away, well, we got some seeds to give away. I could actually say you'll get two bags of seeds if you sit in the front row. <laughs> <laughs> no takers? Anyway, okay, let's get started. So, um, I don't know everything. Pardon? You Sure, lower the lights, take her away. Yes, thank you. I don't. At least the front row. <laughs> so I'd like to get to know my audience just a little tiny bit, if that's okay with you. So how many Audubon members here? Yay! How many native plant members here? Good! How many gardeners here? Ooh, this is a good group. This is great. Anybody plan for butterflies? All right, good. All right. So the Audubon Plants for Birds program started about six or seven years ago and fit right into the kind of things that I'd like to do. Go ahead. I, she's my, my helper there. So birds are everywhere in our lives, right? Yep, yeah, they're on the beach. They're in the wetlands, they're on our dinner table sometimes, and at our celebrations. Unfortunately though, our little wild birds are not doing so well. We've lost 2.9 billion birds since 1970. That's really awful. Where did they go? Okay, who can tell me what this bird is? Very good. All right, give that girl, that woman, an extra bag of bird seed. Go ahead. What'd she say? Yellow rock warbler. Thank you. Yep, and they're getting ready to go up north again, so they're changing colors. So take a look because they they may be looking kind of different. Okay, so why? What's going on? Who can tell me who this is? What thrush? Very good. All right. We're going to go through this quickly. Go ahead, Deb. Bora. Uh... That works? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh-oh. <laughs> well, it was working. <laughs> Somebody had the wrong button. Yeah, the wood thrush threw it out. The wood thrush messed it up. 
Thrush is that we um, haven't necessarily taken good care of its habitat. Well, what is its habitat? Well, in the winter, it goes down to Central America and lives in those forests. In the summer, it comes up to visit us. You can see the, uh, the migration pattern there. And when they get, actually get to the United States, they are looking for trees, uh, woodlands, areas that are uninterrupted, uh, to build their nests. And if you can go to the next slide, please. But unfortunately, this is what we're doing to our landscapes. Now, they may go ahead and use these spaces, but unfortunately, we have the neighborhood cats, we have the raccoons, we have noise and traffic. So all kinds of things that are gonna get in the way of them actually being able to raise their young. So unfortunately, this is what it looks like. The wood thrush is really in decline. Go ahead. So 55% in 50 years. And in fact, all neotropical migrants are in decline, up to 41%. Go ahead. Okay, now this is a, this is a quiz. I hope we can hear this. Can you hit, can you hit the, the play? Who can tell me who that is? Yellow-billed cuckoo. Next, please. The yellow-billed cuckoo. And the yellow-billed cuckoo comes and, and visits Florida and nests here in the summertime. So keep an eye open. They should be arriving any day. Yellow-billed cuckoo is a great story, and a great story bird. That's the only bird that can actually eat hairy caterpillars. Not the only bird, but one that can eat hairy caterpillars. I've seen them in five minutes. Not quite yet. Okay. <laughs> and we're moving right ahead. What's that? Um, well, we skipped the slide about the, the decline of the yellow-billed cuckoo, but that's okay. All right, so what's this one? Sweet, 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 sweet. Close. Prothonotary. Good. Very good. The prothonotary warbler, also once upon a time called the golden swamp warbler. You move ahead. Now you can see why. Beautiful, beautiful little bird. And unfortunately, this is also one of our migrants. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. 42% decline. Really, really sad. Okay, here's another quiz. That bird. You should all know this bird. This mockingbird? What is the only bird, the bird that lives only in Florida? The Florida scrub jay. There it is. How many people have seen a Florida scrub jay? All right. Well, unfortunately, the Florida scrub jay is in real, real bad trouble. Go ahead. In fact, 90% decline in the last 50 years because we like the same kind of places they do, high and dry. And that's where we raise our citrus and a lot of our vegetables. So really a problem. Okay, go ahead. Um, and by the way, if you ever see a Florida scrub jay, please do not feed them. Very bad. Mm. Anyway, um, and most of the birds that use our habitat are in, in trouble. So many of you have seen the beautiful swallowtail kite that comes up to nest here in the summertime. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Deborah. Ah. And our iconic Florida resident, 
as moving around. And every once in a while, you know, you'll be driving along the road, you go, oh, how exciting, I saw Rosie's food mill or a wood stork on the side of the road. It's not good news. The reason they're there is because they've been displaced from where they should be. Mm. So what are we going to do about this? Well, this is often your typical yard in Florida or in the southeast. And if it's not that large landscape, it's a little tiny postage stamp of a yard. Next slide, please. 54% of US is now developed in a suburban or urban area. Um, and on those, in that 54% um, landscape, next slide, 80% non-native. So, looks pretty, looks nice, easy to take care of. What's the big deal? Well, loss of habitat is the greatest threat to birds and wildlife. Next. So, let's think about, instead of this, this. Looks quite different. Makes all the difference between life and death for the little birds. Go ahead. We have overstory. So, we were talking, Paola, trees. They don't have to be 80-foot trees. They can be 20-foot trees. But mid-story and ground cover. It's really, really important to have all of those components. So what you're doing is you're not really just planting native plants, you are creating habitat. Go ahead. So let's just cover the basics. What do we need to, what do birds need to be in, to, uh, to survive? Well, of course they need water. People say to me, what, what's the first thing I should put in my yard? And I say, put in a bird bath, number one. Obviously, they need food if they're going to hang around for a while. If they're really going to hang around for a while, they want shelter and safe passage. And, uh, of course, our nesters, we want them to raise their cute little birds in our yard. So, go ahead. We're really going to focus on, on food, but we're going to run through this real quickly. And, by the way, um, most of these photographs are taken in my yard. So I say when you're going to provide water, make sure you do small, medium, and large. So if you have big birds, like a robin or whatever, you can have a deep bird bath. But if you have a teeny tiny little warbler whose legs are only about an inch and a half long, you give him a big bird bath and he's going to drown. So you need to make sure that you just give him about a half an inch of water. Hmm. Okay, so quiz time. Top, everybody should know that. American Robin, and lower left, okay, looking at that deep pool saying, and not for me, and what's the one on the right, this is the first. Orange Crown. Orange Crown, how did you know that? I have one. You have one, and you know what, you can barely see a little bit of an orange crown on his head, which I, which I, is the first time I've seen it. They say when they name birds, Lots of times it's a bird in the hand, so the ornithologist can sit there and mess with the feathers or whatever, and he saw the orange crown, but oftentimes we don't see it. Go ahead. I also, I did this kind of cool thing. I made a mister. So I took one of those old-fashioned twisty um, uh, spray things, and I, I wired it up to a branch on a tree, and I spray the water up in the air because a lot of birds will actually bathe in the leaves. They're not gonna come down to a bird bath. The other thing that's cool about it is that they hear the water running. And lots of times when I turn it on, I'll have birds come from, you know, from houses way, way far away because they hear that water. So this is uh, one of my great crested flycatchers enjoying my mister. So, yes, Paula. Is that mister connected to your Water hose? Yeah. Or? Yes, it's connected to the water hose. I just turn it on for a little while. They come in. Um, then they'll use the bass if they need. So. Do you happen to know if you can have a mister with a rain barrel? Uh, you could probably need a little pump, though. Pump. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And then we can move on to food. We have bird seed. And this is my. I have um, close to a hundred chipping sparrows who spend their winter with me. So, and part of that is my habitat. So, 
Um, I like to create art with, with sparrows. I kind of put the seed and the little, little squirrels out in my yard so I have the, you know, the birds come in in little squirrels. It's kind of fun. Um, so we have seed eaters, right? Okay, next. And especially before <coughs> migration right now, this is what my yard looks like with all my goldfinches. Um, yeah. So they, during the winter, are going to eat the, the uh, wild seed that's out in the fields because it's very rural where I am. There you go. So, um, but before they get ready to, to head back up north, they'll, they will fatten up big time. So, go ahead. And then we have who has seen a hummingbird this year? Yay, they're back. I was so excited yesterday. I was on the phone with somebody and I had just had to, had to stop and, and let them know. I think they thought it was kind of nuts. But anyway, so if you have feeders or flowers, the birds may just come and actually hang out. And this little guy was just sunbathing. He was fine. Just having a, just having a chill. All right. Okay, so the next thing is we said food, we said water, we said food. This is shelter. Um, you want to make sure you have low, medium, high shelter. So the robins love to hit, hang out on the ground. Yes? Uh, you know, I didn't see one single squirrel in that uh, picture with all the birds. How are you keeping your squirrels away from <laughs> We could talk about that later. That okay. could go on forever. Okay. But, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so we, the robins will use the ground. We have our catbirds that will kind of use a mid-story. And then it's always good to have a couple of snags around because my swallowtail kites, I had seven of them at the end of my street. So um, having that, that shelter or that habitat on, on every level is important. Go ahead. And then we have our nests. Well, some will build nests and other will use our, um, some of these cute little bird, bird uh, houses that we put in. It was so funny. I actually got a chickadee box, and the chickadees liked it, and they're using it now. But they were competing with a, what kind of bird is that? Downy. Downy woodpecker, yes. Um, and my husband goes, Jackie, do you think he can get out of there? I said, well, he got in. I think he can get out. So. And others will build nests just about anywhere. How many people have had a Carolina Wren in their garage? Yeah, in the boot, in the plant, in the whatever. Yep, hmm. I've decided that Carolina Wrens know that we don't like snakes a whole lot, and they don't either. So they figure the closer they are to us, the, the more likely they're not gonna get eaten by a snake. But anyway, okay, next. So, but really what we're here to talk about is food. So let's circle back. So 96% of land birds feed insects to their chicks, right? Worms, caterpillars, whatever. Next. And here are a couple of our local birds feeding their, their young ones insects. We have up, what's the upper left? Yellow-throated warbler. Yellow warbler. Yellow warbler, very good. And what about the right? Kestrel, okay. very good. All right, go ahead. So what's really fun is because they like bugs, we can have a really good time with the bugs in our yard and create kind of like a bird garden or a bird buffet. Go ahead. How many of you have seen this book? How many of you have heard him speak? Okay. So Doug Tallamy, is a, he's a bug guy and he's from the University of Delaware. And he is really the person that brought it all together for me. Um, and I'm gonna explain why. But I love because he says, garden as though life depends on it. And really, honest, honest, to, tr honest to God, it's the truth. Go ahead. So this is his theory. So we have certain soils and landscapes all over Florida, right? They vary. And through the years, the, the native plants have grown to use those soils. If it's really sandy, they might be able to withstand uh, drought, um, but they're gonna use the chemicals in those soils. So the plants get very specific to the soils. Now the insects also 
do the same thing. They get very specific to the plants, for the most part. What does the monarch butterfly eat? Milkweed. Milkweed. Is that all? I think so. Right. So if you don't have milkweed, you're not going to have monarch butterflies. And there are many, many insects that are like that. And if you're a butterfly gardener, you don't just put in flowers. You put in the plants that are the larval host. That's the ho that is what those caterpillars will eat. And when the mother or the when the mother butterfly is flying around looking to where to lay her eggs, she's looking for that specific plant. And if you don't have that plant, you're not going to have that butterfly. So if you don't have those bugs, then when the birds, those 96% of those <laughs> birds that eat insects to raise their young, if you don't have those insects, you're not going to have those birds. Next. Okay. So a world without insects is a world without birds because plants are the foundation of ecosystems. And I've actually gotten thinking more and more about this. How many people had some sort of fruit today? Pollinated that fruit. So it's not just about the birds, it's about us ultimately as well. Go ahead. As I say, no bugs, no birds. And this is a really great picture because this guy, anybody know what it is? It's another orange crown warbler, and it's, the lighting is very strange, but it's eating aphids. And we don't like aphids, so it's really glad that we have this bird eating aphids in our yard. So, this is um, my yard, and I, I have a lot, of, uh, a lot of a variety of plants, but I also like to let people know why my yard looks the way it looks. And I make a major effort to make the front yard look nice because I want to be an ambassador to native plants. Lots of times people, you know, they put in native plants and they let them kind of go and, and you, you think, well, I don't have to maintain them. No. If you're going to get people to enjoy your yard, you're going to need to make it look nice. So I'd like to let people know why I'm doing what I'm doing. Go ahead, Deborah. So, as Doug Tallamy points out in his book, which is a fabulous book, I really highly recommend it, but you can also go see him online and YouTube. He says that plants, you need to select the plants based on how functional they are. So the oak family uses, uh, the oak family is used by 557 species of Lepidoptera. Lepidoptera is butterflies and moths. Now, not necessarily um, the live oak, but some of the white oaks and the red oaks. So, where a ginkgo, which is a nice, nice enough plant, only is really going to support five species of butterflies. So, I mean, of caterpillars. Go ahead. So, it's important to, to include those natives because Throughout the year, they're going to have insects. And this was in the middle of the winter, I had one of these galardias, which of course they've now decided is came from Texas, it's not really a Florida native anymore. But I walked out one day, and, then, and it was cold. In North Florida, it can get quite chilly. And I had a bee and a caterpillar on one flower. So that's the kind of richness you really want to go for. And this little swamp milkweed actually is pollinated by ants and flies. So again, a whole different type of insect. Go ahead. And flowers come in all shapes and sizes, and so do the critters that pollinate them. And I guarantee you, there's a bird that eats every single one of these, <laughs> every single one of these insects. Go ahead. And this is this is one of my favorites. This is a little ground cover. Um, called um, Sunshine Mimosa, and you can use this instead of putting grass in your yard. And the, and the bees love it. Look at the pollen on the leg on this bee. It's like, how can it fly? I can't believe that. Anyway, and this flowers for a long period of time. Just a lovely little plant. Go ahead. 
The native azaleas, right now, boy, up in, up in North Florida, the azaleas are going nuts, you know, South Carolina, North Carolina, all those beautiful azaleas, all the different colors. None of those are native. People can't believe it. But I put in some native azaleas, and I could not believe the number of flowers. In fact, I was almost late coming down today because the butterflies were, my native azaleas are blooming, the butterflies were all over them, and I couldn't stop taking pictures. So I decided I would try and start documenting all the different things that use just this one plant. So this is the, well, the bee hummingbird, which is actually a moth, <coughs> the bee hummingbird. Go ahead, the next one. Uh, we have the tiger swallowtail and the spice bush and the, and the um, sulfur and one of the skippers. So this is just one plant that gets all of these different types of, of uh, insects. And what's really cool is this native azalea also smells. Hmm. The other azaleas don't smell. And this one is just, just, just heavenly sweet. Go ahead. Um, here are another couple ones. My, my um, Baptisia is just starting to bloom. And then we have um, the, the volunteer, the pokeberry. Um, that's actually, it's pretty funny because the pokeberry has, uh, is, was planted by the birds because they eat the birds and they poop, you know. And in fact, I say lots of times, the birds will help you design your yard. Unfortunately, they also bring in Brazilian pepper and some other <laughs> exotics, which are not so great. So go ahead, De Deborah. The hollies are great. The hollies are like a twofer because not only do they bloom in the spring and the insects love them, um, but then they make a berry and the birds will eat the berries afterwards. Uh, I have a holly tree right in the front of my, right out my front door, and when it's in bloom, you can hear it. You can hear it buzzing. And way up high in the sun is where the little tiny um, hair streak butterflies are. So it's, it's really pretty neat. You have to have a female. Hmm? You have to have a female. You have to have a female. He says you have to have a female. Well, don't we, doesn't everybody have to have a female? Well, yeah. only the female makes the berries. So if you dig up one from nature, it may be a male and you may never get there. Okay, so you need to ask your native plant person whether it's a male or a female and make sure you get both. Right, I have so many, I guess they took care of it. Um, this is a viburnum. And again, we get the beautiful, beautiful flowers in the springtime and then we get the berries in the fall, which the birds will use. So you have a... Um, Zebra swallowtail. Do you guys have zebra swallowtails down here? Yeah. yeah. So, um, and a horse's dusky wing butterfly. Go ahead. And this was just a couple of, of insects that were hanging out. We had a red march and um, hair streak and a hackberry emperor. So, takes me a while to remember all the names. But this, you know, just, just a couple of plants, and these are the kinds of things that you get. So go ahead. And then you might actually see the entire uh, life cycle of, of the insect. This is the uh, spice bush swallowtail. And I'll tell you, we had, the, we had the, uh, the eggs, and we had the caterpillars, and then this was a newly emerged adult. And it has beautiful flowers in the spring. You have to be careful though. I, I tend to be one of those people who wants to teach the kids about the butterflies. So I go and I, I pick up the caterpillar. And this one will put a stink on you. So it's got those pheromones and it does this thing. So it won't hurt you, but you have to wash your hands for a few times after that. So go ahead. Um, this is one of my favorites. I'm not sure it grows this far south. This is a sparkleberry. And the sparkleberries, when it flowers, because these flowers are tiny, teeny tiny, it takes little tiny pollinators to po pollinate them. And these are three different species of hair streak on the same plant. Hmm. Anybody know the hair streaks? I call them, I call them the warblers of the butterfly world because they're tiny, they move fast, and they're beautiful. And what's neat is you see those little, little appendages off the, the back end of them? When they're, when they're sitting there, they actually move them back and forth. And, it, and they also usually have a spot toward the back. 
And the theory is that they're trying to fool the bird that might eat them. The bird can't figure out which end is up. <laughs> he doesn't know which end is the real antenna. So anyway, go ahead. And then even the weeds. Okay, who can tell me what a weed is? Anything that's growing where you don't want it to. Oh, good. We got two. We got two <laughs> perfect scores up here in the front. A weed is a plant in a place where you don't want it. So um, these plants are native plants, and they are in my yard. And most people don't want them in their lawn, but I watch who they attract. And they do. We have this tropical checker and a painted lady, just on these little tiny weeds. So I recently did. Uh, I had a, a, a long strip along the front of, of my yard and uh, I pulled up all the grass and a lot of native things came up. And before I started pulling them all out, I let them grow for quite a while to see who was using them. And I actually ended up leaving a lot of stuff because I realized it was valuable for, for, the, for the insects. So, go ahead. One of my favorites, a question mark, just sitting there in my yard because um, whatever it was, it's horrible host food I had put in the yard, so I can't remember what it is off, offhand. But just, just beautiful, beautiful butterflies. Go ahead. And there are things that, that bloom for long periods of time and things that are very <coughs> easy to find in the landscape. Um, the coral honeysuckle is something that um, both the hummingbirds will use and the, and the sulfur butterflies in particular. And then I love this little green eyes that will bloom just about all summer long. And I had to throw in another one of my azaleas, that's a, the orange one. It actually comes in a, in a bunch of colors as well, but just a, a absolutely beautiful. Go ahead. So, um, and they're not just caterpillars that the birds eat. Uh, they will eat dragonflies and all kinds of other things. Who can tell me what this bird is? And, and loggerhead shrike, and what's the other name for it? The butcher bird. So what he does is he, he takes lizards and dragonflies and whatever, and I guess they used to do this on thorny bushes, but now that we have barbed wire fences, what he'll do is he'll line up all these, his kill on the, on the barbs on the barbed wire fence, and I guess the girls like that. <laughs> Not my style, but anyway, so. And uh, red-eyed vireo, eating whatever caterpillar that is. Um, I've got my friend John taking all kinds of pictures. I said, anytime you find something eating, get me a picture. So go ahead. Um, so I started telling the story about the yellow-billed cuckoo eating hairy caterpillars. So what happens is they eat so many hairy caterpillars that they have hairs all over their stomach and the inlining of their stomach sloths like sloughs off and he gets a new lining on his stomach. Oh, and gee, is that wild or what? Yeah. Go ahead. Who knows what this one is? Hooded Warbler. He lives up to his name. Eating one of my uh, passion vine little uh, Julios. Go ahead. And we have our palm warblers, and we have our Tennessee warblers, all eating those little, little tiny packages of protein in the, in the form of a caterpillar. Go ahead. And again, just a couple more insects, beetles, uh, dragonflies, spiders. Um, I, I hear say that the chickadee actually raises, needs to gather between eight and 9,000 caterpillars to raise a brood. Mm -hmm. That's to get them out of the nest. And then shortly thereafter, they actually start using eating spiders, feeding the spiders, because there are pieces, there's uh, components of the spider that helps them break, um, um, develop their brains, the baby's brains. So um, it's important, spiders are important too. So go ahead. And I love, I love this little guy. You ever watch one of these guys out in the woods, little hermit thrush? And they stand there and they do this with their foot. They vibrate their feet. And what they're trying to do is they're trying to stir up whatever is under the ground. Go ahead. Because like 99% of moths pupate in the ground or under the leaves. 
So another, if, if, if we have any lazy gardeners out there that don't like to rake leaves, good for you. Well, you're gonna have lots of them, lots okay. of them moss there. So, um, go ahead. 94% up, oh, I got it wrong, 94% of the moth caterpillars pupate in ground in the leaf litter. Okay. When will they come when will they come out? Now. Now. Okay. Now over the next several months. Okay. And in fact it was funny because this caterpillar on the left, which is called a lichen caterpillar, when it's on the tree where there's lichen, you can't find it. Yeah. It drops down to pupate. And my dog found it because it was like on the ground, squirreling around. So I brought it inside and I put it in a in a um, under leaves in a t in a tank. And I got to watch the moth come out. I got to watch it because it was glass. I watched it make the pupa, and then I got to see the kind of the moth come out. Go ahead. This is another one that I brought into the house. Again, just beautiful, beautiful at every stage of the game. So it makes, makes every day an adventure. Go ahead. So now you want to go home and you're totally convinced this is what you want to do. So how do you get started? What are your resources? Go ahead. So this is the Audubon uh, Plants for Birds website. If you put in Audubon Plants for Birds, and it asks you to put in your zip code, then you're gonna go to a series of pages and you can figure out if you want, um, what kinds of plants you want, if you want ground cover, mid-story trees, and who it will serve in what capacity. So really, really fun website. Go ahead. Um, and then you have Audubon chapters, and you are here, uh, what number are you? E27, is that you? Yeah. Right there in the middle. And I'm E13 up there by the, by the border with Georgia. So we have 45 chapters in the state. Great resources, probably three quarters of the chapters do some type of Plants for Birds program. Go ahead. And your local chapter is Orange Audubon with the North Shore Birding Festival coming up in, uh, in November, December. Go ahead. And then you have your Native Plant Society. And I know a lot of you are already members of the Native Plant Society. Another great resource. Go ahead. And your local chapter is the tar flower. Tar flower grows in the scrub. Um, and then uh, we have great resources, the Florida Wildflower Foundation. And this book on the left is pretty new. Um, but it has a lot of really, really great resources, pictures where you can um, get the plants. It's excellent. And they have a uh, license plate which raises money to do education around wildflowers. And they also have just great information on, on just about any wildflower you can think of. Go ahead. Um, and they also have put out a book called The Real Florida, which is all kinds of resources on where you can buy stuff. Um, and who's in the industry. Go ahead. And then the Florida Association of Native Nurseries that actually will do more larger uh, commercial um, installations. So go ahead. And this is a map. It's, uh, we talked about how important it is to know your soils so that you know what kind of plants to put in, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so this is also provided by the Florida Association of Native Nurseries. Go ahead. So where do you get started? Paula was asking me. I, she, she said, I just, I don't know. I, I, you know, I'm not a designer. What do I do? So I, when I moved to North Florida uh, 18 years ago, I was faced with a very barren yard. Um, and I didn't really know where to start. So I went to my local state park. Uh, and I looked at a place that was very similar to my backyard. And I said, that looks really pretty to me. I think I'm going to take a picture and I'm going to go see if I can find those plants. So that's what I did. Um, there's the, that beautiful pink azalea. Um, I put in saw palmetto uh, and, a, and a whole bunch of other things. But the neat thing about that was that Mother Nature made the design 
And when I put those plants in, they all needed the same type of um, maintenance. Same water, same light, that type of thing. So, so she really, Mother Nature really solved a lot of the problems for me. Um, so, that's what my yard looks like. So, um, right now I, I keep the front, as I said, I keep it looking really nice because I want people to, uh, to enjoy it and, and um, want to do the same type of thing. And even the mailman comes by and, and says, oh, your yard looks so beautiful today. <laughs> and it was funny, I was, in, I was in Miami, I was on my way overseas a couple of years ago and I ran into a guy um, he said, he said, I know you, you're Miss Jackie. And I said, yeah, where do you know me from? He said, I'm not supposed to, I'm not supposed to mow the flowers in your front yard. <laughs> so that's a good thing to be known for. So, so obviously I made an impression there as well. So go ahead. And that's another shot of my front yard. Um, and that's with my other azalea that you can see. Um, this is this time of year, so I'm, I'm ending up with some really, really beautiful landscapes. Go ahead. So, um, I like to try to inspire people, which is why I tell my story. And you, as native plant gardeners, can become ambassadors as well. And in fact, our, my local chapter, uh, we're doing a project this year, it's called Become a Native Plant Ambassador. And instead of just teaching people how to garden and all that stuff, we're taking existing gardeners and we're gonna help them make the transition from a non-native yard to a native yard, keep it looking nice, and they're gonna get a sign to put out front so that people understand that sign. Yeah, this was, this was the sign that we showed. Um, so that people understand why you're doing what you're doing. So you actually become an ambassador for the cause. Okay. So help us create change. <laughs> Wait for you to get it. Okay, got it? All right. So because, as we like to say at Audubon, you are what hope looks like to a bird. One more, and we're done. All right. Very good. Any questions? Change to the choir, right? Mm -hmm. So, will you show the photograph of the developments? Is anyone working with developers and other politicians yes. in the state of Florida to help create natural environment? You know. So she says, "I'm preaching to the choir." Is anybody working with everybody else? Well, I think I want chapters are a lot. Um, in fact, Florida Power and Light gives us $25,000 a year to share with chapters to, to get them to plant native plants in public places with signs. Um, we are actually working with the solar farms, those huge solar farms now, to um, plant only native plants. They have a native plant list to create connectivity, to remove exotics and replant them with other good stuff. Each, each one of the solar farms has a huge budget for doing that. Um, homeowners associations, uh, one of the chapters did uh, something I thought was really cool. They had 60 ponds on their, in their development, 60. So they went to the maintenance people and said, if we buy the plants, will you install them around some of our ponds? And they said, yep, and we'll match it. So they had $5,000. They actually um, planted six ponds. And because they were not sure what people were gonna think, they actually did Ponds 101 as one of their events and Ponds 102 as one of their events. So that people would see these changes happening and they would start, they would understand why and be more accepting. Um, because, you know, it's much easier to mow right down to the water. So, um, so yes, it, it, it's happening, but very slowly. And that's why I'm saying becoming that ambassador, is, it's not just about you doing it, it's about you telling your story. It's very important, so. Thank you. All right, any other questions? 
Yes. M maybe Talmy has done this research, but is there is there evidence that these backyards that are done ideally like this when when combined are definitively uh, good resources for birds? And what I, what I mean is is there is there evidence that it's net productivity, or are there problems with maybe this being an attractive nuisance? Because this is something that's supposed to be done at a, at a national scale, right? That's the national park, the backyards is national park. And <coughs> we, we know that wood thrushes, for example, need a certain condition for nesting, but the young after fledging need another condition that needs to be in close proximity. And if it has good nesting habitat, but not good habitat for the fledglings, perhaps they don't survive. So is this, is this, I'm just posing the question about whether Talmy has looked at the overall benefits of, of this comprehensive strategy. Well, he does, and in one of his talks, he talks about um, a gra one of his graduate students tracking the chickadees. And that's why he knows how many caterpillars they need to raise a brood. And his, uh, he says about 75, 80% natives in order to sustain that population. Now the good thing is that most birds will move, not the Florida scrub jay, unfortunately, but most birds will move so they can go to other areas. They will look for other areas. Um, in terms of the homegrown national park, I think that, that his idea is that if we all do a little bit in our yards, we've actually created a large mosaic, which, hmm. which should work. Um, he says, you know, our, our ethic, our culture says we're here and nature is over there. Mm -hmm. And what we need to do is be a part of nature mm -hmm. or have a nature be part of us. So um, I know in, in the time that I've been there, the changes that have happened in my yard are extraordinary, are really extraordinary. And they cleared three lots two years ago, and I saw a change. So I realized how important it is to have, you know, some of these insects and birds fairly close by so they will come and populate um, you know, people sometimes will put up a, a bird feeder and say, well, I, I, I don't get any birds. And I say, well, where's the nearest green space? You know, mm -hmm. well, if you live in a, in a big city, you're not necessarily going to have that population to draw from. However, if you turn on the water and you have green space during migration, I guarantee you're going to have birds. I was uh, living in Fort Lauderdale mm -hmm. before I moved north. And I went out one day, I had a lot of green space because I was doing the same thing and I had water. And I went out, I had nine species of warbler in my bird bath. Wow. I mean, they were in and out, the five mm -hmm. in and whatever. It was unbelievable. Mm -hmm. When I moved to North Florida and there was a lot more green space, I never, I've never had that concentration of birds unless it's 100 degrees in the afternoon and I turn on the mister. so, mm -hmm. but good question. All right, yes. Yes, there's prescribed burns being done in the state parks, et cetera, and right after the burn, the, the uh, palmetto comes up pretty quick, but what about the other plants as well? Do they come up, seeing that variety that you have in your yard with the uh, azaleas, et cetera, do they come up pretty quick too, or what? They absolutely do. Um, again, these plants are all adapted to the same type of habitat, and because we are the burn, the lightning, strike capital of the world we always have fires in florida or we did historically mm -hmm. so all these plants are very very well adapted to fire so and the interesting thing is that the um you talking about jim cox the the sparrows lots of times um their ground they they spend a lot of time on the ground if the grass gets too thick the sparrows can't move through it so right. their ideal nesting period is like within weeks after a burn. Mm. So um, a lot of things that we don't really understand, mm -hmm. but um, you know, respect these habitats and mother nature and do what you can in your own. So thank you very much. Um, yeah. Thank you. Um, in terms of being an ambassador, if anybody likes to write, will you submit a little blurb about your yard and your experience with it? You can use that to spread the word.